Thank you so much great people for tuning once again today. I'm very glad and very happy to welcome you around again in our channel. Today we are looking at the biggest secret of ABBA. This is a very wonderful story and I would urge you just to sit back and relax as we go through this very beautiful story. If today is your first time tuning I do say thank you and please press that subscription button so that in future you'll be able to get these great videos and to our returning friends I do say thank you so much and feel welcome so let us jump straight away into this great uh, video In the 1970s, the music scene was dominated by disco. Into that world stepped Swedish pop sensation ABBA. With nine number one singles and 17 successive UK hits, they would become the most popular group since the Beatles. ABBA pretty much did what came naturally and uh, you know, it was the right time, the right place. You know, the right country and more important and most important, the right music. But beneath the carefree image, one of the smiling Swedes was hiding a dark secret. A secret that had its roots in wartime Europe. ABBA took the music world by storm when they won the Eurovision Song Contest final in 1974. Some 300 million people throughout Europe watched as the previously unknown Swedish quartet launched their bid for fame. ABBA really created a sensation that day back in 1974 at the finals of the Eurovision Song Contest because the conductor came out just like Napoleon. Oh, oh and it's Napoleon! They came out in very colourful clothes. I mean, they really did make a point. Waterloo! by ABBA for Sweden. They really made an effort here. Uh, the costumes were very, very bright. The girls, of course, Frida and Anita, uh, were particularly beautiful. They had uh, long, lovely legs. The legs seemed to go on forever. Uh, the guys, I didn't really notice too much, to be honest with you. Uh, but um, I thought the whole effect was terrific. Well, it just hit us all so much, the number one. It was, they were so much the winners. Um, they, they just burst upon the scene and everybody loved them immediately. They've surely got to be up amongst the reckoning with that one. Waterloo won by a landslide, catapulting the group, and especially its two glamorous lead singers, to instant fame. It's certainly gone down well here inside the Dome in Brighton. I think what made ABBA really stand out in terms of visibility in the 70s throughout their, their big career was perhaps, um, you know, taking the music away. It was probably the girls and the fact that, you know, Anna Frieth, Frida, had this kind of mysterious image, the quiet one of the group, and, uh, and Agneta was very much kind of like the pin-up that the, the, the guys wanted to uh, put up on their wall and, and find out more about. And the guys were kind of quietly in the background churning out the hits. While ABBA went from hit to hit, the group's image and music was kept under strict control. That control continues even today, two decades after the band split up. Their management refused permission for their music to be used in the making of this film. The private lives of the four stars were off limits to the press from the very beginning. They were just paranoid about keeping everything about themselves um, quiet. They wanted to be uh, they wanted to be remembered for their music and they didn't want anything to uh, from their lives to to spoil what was a very good commercial operation. They seemed to be very private people. They just went up on stage, sung the songs and that was it. They didn't seem to do interviews, you didn't know anything else about them and it seemed that nobody seemed to want to know very much about them. They seemed to be very surface if you like. Even in their rare interviews the group was clearly happy answering only the most superficial questions about themselves. The last time you were on, uh, uh, this is Bjorn and Agneta. Right. You were married. 
Yeah, yeah we are. We okay. still are. Still. still are. Oh. In spite of this year. That's right. In spite of a whole year yeah. of enormous success. Now you talk about something. Now you were engaged. Yes, we were. Right. Since you were yes. still engaged. Yeah, we yes. are still engaged. <laughs> That's a long engagement. She you... won't marry me. She won't. <laughs> Frida, why you won't? Why won't you marry him? I'm too pretty. Oh. <laughs> But one of them was carrying with her a legacy of the past, a legacy that remained carefully buried despite the worldwide glare of publicity. Almost overnight, ABBA had jumped into the big league. They became an absolute machine that just took over the charts. It seemed as if they could do no wrong, and if they wanted a hit, they would have a hit. As ABBA enjoyed hit after hit, media interest reached its peak. Despite the best efforts of their PR machine, the personal anonymity that they had enjoyed for so long inevitably came under attack. British journalist Harry Edgington was commissioned to write a warts and all biography of ABBA. They were certainly the biggest pop group since the Beatles and they were selling in numbers in some countries that even the Beatles had never sold in places like Australia, certain countries in Europe. They were just a worldwide phenomenon. Nothing got out about their earlier life. So they would be presented as the um, four smiling perfect Swedes. His research took him to Stockholm, where he met a producer who had worked with ABBA since they were teenagers, and who was said to know the band better than they knew themselves. Harry soon discovered that there was a dark secret beneath ABBA's untroubled surface. He knew them. Uh, from their very early days so that he knew exactly where they'd started from, what had happened and he knew where all the, all the skeletons were and they just tumbled out. Harry began by looking at Frida, the quiet one of the band and soon he knew why. Frida's story was stranger than fiction. Harry had struck gold. I, I had no idea that she had the background that um, I now know, and I, yeah, one can understand why she was quiet about all this. Frida's story led straight back to the horrors of wartime Norway and a secret that had lain dormant for years. With their good looks and flamboyant costumes, it was Frida and Agneta who became the figureheads of the band and the focus of much public and media interest. But it was a role that Frida in particular found difficult to cope with. She didn't say very much, and uh, I think that made her more mysterious and, and perhaps more alluring. We knew very little about Frida. She was the one who was always very, very introspective. Um, she was quite bubbly on stage and when, uh, you know, when they had presentations. But in private life, she was the one who was always very, very moody, spending time on her own, and uh, often seemed deep in thought. As Harry Edgington discovered, the clues to Frida's personality were buried deep in her past, a past that was full of surprises. His first discovery was that Frida Lingstad, the Swedish sex symbol, wasn't Swedish at all. She had been born in Norway at the end of the Second World War. Unlike their Swedish neighbours, who remained neutral, Norwegians endured nearly five years of Nazi occupation. In 1940, Hitler's German army, which had been rampaging through Europe for over a year, turned its attention to Norway. That spring, the Germans attacked Norway by sea and air in a tremendous show of force. Within months, the seemingly unstoppable Nazi war machine had moved in. Norway became yet another outpost of the Third Reich. The local population was all but swamped by an occupying force of nearly half a million. Young German soldiers were everywhere. They were outgoing and apparently making an effort to fit in with the locals. Their presence turned village life upside down. The Germans occupied the houses and their uh, physical uh, 
contact with the Norwegians was very close and there was absolutely no way of escaping this contact for the, for the Norwegians. If you take a small village where maybe uh, in a population of 40 people, maybe there was four or five young girls from 16 to 18 years, 20 years, and suddenly, suddenly uh, 400 Germ Germans came, German soldiers came. It was very, very difficult to avoid that, that some of these girls and some of these Germans became uh, lovers in, in some way or another. Northern Norway saw more than its fair share of occupying Nazis. Thousands of German troops were sent to the town of Narvik and the neighbouring village of Ballingen. It was here that Frida was born. Frida's mother, Sini Lingstad, was just 17 when the war began. The Lingstads and their five children lived in Ballingen. Their youngest daughter, Sini, soon became an object of desire for many of the occupying German soldiers stationed nearby. As she worked in her front garden, Sinny caught the eye of a young German officer called Alfred Hase. He was married with a young wife and child waiting for him back at home. Sinny was nervous of Alfred at first. He was an enemy soldier and local feelings against the Nazis ran high. But he was polite and persistent in his advances. Before long, Sinny had fallen madly in love with Alfred. All the meetings between Sinny and, and Alfred had to be um, kind of fairly secretive, you know, in some cabin somewhere, maybe where they could spend some time together. And at one point they went down to the sea and, uh, you know, wanted to go for a swim and they took off all their clothes and, uh, you know, the next thing they knew they were, they were making love on the beach. He brought along a gift, a sack of potatoes. It was, it sounds pretty unglamorous, but uh, it was wartime and, and it was a very welcome gift. And she was a young, impressionable girl. She fell for it. Alfred hadn't told Sinny that he was already married, and she managed somehow to ignore the fact that he was also an enemy soldier. She presented Alfred as a really charming man, which he, which he may have been. But he was obviously um, uh, a dedicated Nazi because at 24 years old he was in charge of, of the troops of that region. But her family was less than happy. Relations with the occupying German forces were frowned upon. In their dashing uniforms and armed with gifts and food, the German soldiers had no trouble finding Norwegian girlfriends. The romance between Frida's mother and Alfred Hase was repeated throughout Norway. After two years, Alfred was posted back to Germany. He was given just one day to prepare for his departure. The night before he left, he made one last effort to see Sinny. This was to be the last time Alfred Hase saw Sinny Lingstad. She cried as he cycled away to catch his troop ship at dawn the next morning. Neither knew that their last night together had left Sinny pregnant. Nine months later, she was to give birth to a baby daughter. She called her Annie Fleet, but she was to become better known to the world as Frida. Frida Lingstad, a singer in one of the world's most famous pop groups, was the daughter of a Nazi officer. That surprises me. That's probably why she kept very quiet about everything. Uh, Perhaps the, the fact that your father's a Nazi officer wouldn't have done a great deal for record sales. So I can understand now why she wasn't too openly uh, spoken up. Well, not that, of course, it's his, her fault, but I didn't realise that. No, it's a, it's a surprise to me, that. When we found out about Frida, it was, it was quite a shock to everybody. She used to feel the pain of her having that relationship where the father had gone and disappeared and the father was a Nazi. And um, the, the, so the mother had to live with it. And Frida really had to live with it, but she had to live with it more or less in secret. Frida's father never came back to Norway, despite his promises. Her heartbroken mother was later told that his ship had been sunk on the way back to Germany. Frida would grow up without a father. 
But that was just part of the story. Only later would the full truth behind her birth emerge. It was a revelation whose consequences spread far beyond Frida and her world. Throughout Norway, young women had been seduced by German soldiers during the war. Frida was only one of thousands of children born to German soldiers and Norwegian mothers. By the end of the war, there may have been as many as 10,000 of them. For the young Norwegian women, the babies were the result of a love affair. But for the Nazis, these births were far from accidental. They were part of a carefully drawn Nazi plan, the biggest human experiment the world has ever seen. The children were to be part of Hitler's dream, the racially pure heirs of his new German empire, the master race. And Frieda was to be part of that plan. In 1935, Hitler translated his master race theory into law. From then on, Germany was subject to a program of racial selection based on the belief that Aryans were genetically superior. Hitler entrusted SS chief Heinrich Himmler with implementing his racial policy. He set up special homes where racially approved women gave birth to their children, whom they could leave for adoption by SS families if they wished. They were called Lebensborn homes, Lebensborn meaning fountain of life. Himmler ordered the supposedly pure men of the SS to father as many children as possible, whether with their wives or with any suitable Aryan woman, for the glory of the Third Reich. There was a sinister urgency to the Lebensborn project. The other arm of Hitler's racial purity policy was the eradication of those considered racially undesirable. Jews, gypsies, and many others. They were to be replaced by the pure Lebensborn children. But the scale of the Holocaust deaths was so vast that the numbers of new approved babies simply couldn't keep pace. Across occupied Europe, blonde-haired, blue-eyed children were kidnapped and brought back to Germany to swell the numbers. And when they invaded Norway, the Germans saw the perfect chance to expand the Lebensborn program. The circumstances were ideal. A population of racially valuable young Aryan women and 400,000 German soldiers who could sleep with local women, not just without recrimination, but out of patriotic duty. In other occupied countries, German soldiers were forbidden to make friends with the locals. But in Norway, all soldiers, and especially officers like Alfred Haser, were under orders to sleep with and impregnate Norwegian women. Romance was an added bonus. All the Nazis had to do was provide a place for the women to give birth in safety and secrecy and let nature take its course. On Himmler's orders, Nine Lebensborn homes were quickly set up throughout southern Norway where women could give birth in secret. The breeding program was a huge success. Gert Fleischer was one of the children to be born in a Norwegian Lebensborn home. I can imagine how the German Reich uh, looked upon the Lebensborn, Lebensborn movement in Norway. Now they were really going to get some 100% Aryan uh, uh, products. Frida's mother, Sinni, was one of those supposedly 100% Aryans whose genes the Nazis wanted. Couples like Frida's parents were part of this policy. Her father, as a German officer, was encouraged to father children. Her mother, as a Norwegian, was regarded as perfect breeding stock. 
The pattern was repeated all over Norway. Many mothers, their anonymity protected, accepted the offer to leave their babies in the homes, believing they would be well cared for and offered a secure future. But in the event of an Allied victory, an altogether different fate awaited them. There was such a stigma attached to being involved with the Germans in any sort of way and, and you know, being in a, in a romantic relationship with the German soldier was, was just uh, the biggest crime it could commit. Throughout the war, the Norwegian government in exile broadcast warnings to collaborators, especially those like Frida's mother, who had had affairs with German soldiers. We have previously issued a warning, and we repeat it here, of the price these women will pay for the rest of their lives. They will be held in contempt by all Norwegians for their lack of restraint. In May 1945, the Germans surrendered. Himmler committed suicide, and the Lebensborn project came abruptly to an end. King Haakon and his government return to Norway. A parade through the streets of Oslo marks the event. Norwegians rejoiced as the king returned from exile in London. But in Norway, thousands of half-German children found themselves in limbo. The Norwegians' hatred of their conquerors boiled over into revenge. For the thousands of women who had taken German lovers, retribution was at hand. Collaborationists are paid off in full measure for consorting with the enemy. Public humiliation is, in reality, mild punishment for traitors. Collaborators had a hard time all over Europe, but in Norway, the hatred extended to their children. The whole Norway hated the Germans um, so much that um, it was almost um, too much to ask of them to accept somebody like me, child of the enemy, child of the hated. In this unforgiving atmosphere, Frida's mother struggled to bring up her baby daughter. Even though Frida was born a few months after the end of the war, there was no escaping the anger of their neighbors. Everybody in Ballingen knew that Frieda's father was a German soldier. There was a lot of animosity towards her, towards uh, Sinny. Uh, for having the child, people would be uh, unpleasant, spit in the streets. Sinny's mother felt that this is not a good place for, for my granddaughter, which was Frieda, obviously, to, to grow up. So she decided that, you know, we're going to Sweden because that's a safe environment and we can start a new life and no one knows who we are. Moving to Sweden saved Frida from being punished for her mother's actions. But for the two-year-old, the heartache was just beginning. And soon after they'd arrived there, Frida's mother, Sinny, she came after. And she actually got a job there, and uh, things were sort of looking up. But, but then something happened. One day she just collapsed at home. And she was rushed to, the rushed to the hospital, and it turned out that there was some problem with her kidneys and there was surgery and, and all that, but uh, it turned out that her life couldn't be saved. Sinny's childhood friend, Sara Mura, remembers how devastated the family were at her death. It was awful. And I thought of Anifred, that she should lose her mother. She was only a little girl when her mother died. She didn't understand anything about what was happening. And I think that was what we thought about most, that little Anifred had lost her mother. At the age of two, Frida was motherless. Her father had disappeared 
and her own community had rejected her as a child of the enemy. But she was at least safe once she got to Sweden. Frida's grandmother, Arnatine Lingstad, was determined that her granddaughter's life would not be destroyed. In Sweden, nobody knew that Frida's father was a German soldier or that she had been part of the Nazi's sinister breeding program. Anonymity was her savior, but Frida's childhood was far from happy. Now an orphan, Frida was all alone. She used to talk to her friends about that, uh, about her mother, who she didn't know very well, but she'd have a, she'd, when the subject would come up, she'd have a very misty look in her, in her eye and uh, seeking to remember the mother that she hardly, that she hardly could recall. Her grandmother was, you know, she was just so busy with trying to make things work and, and making a new life for herself in, in, in this new country. So she, she didn't really have the energy to, uh, to be affectionate towards her granddaughter. Her background would have, would have made her a quieter child. Obviously, with an upbringing of sadness she had in her lives, I imagine it would affect anybody that way. They ended up in Torshalle, a small town an hour's drive from Stockholm. Frida, she was a very lonely child, and she would spend a lot of time alone in her room reading books and, uh, and that kind of thing. But I think what saved her really was music. She was very much appreciated in school for her good singing voice as well and started singing in, in the local choir and, and all that. So I think she discovered pretty early that I want to be a singer and that's what I'm going to do when, I'm, when I grow up. The famous Miss Doris Day has gladly consented to sing a few songs for us tonight. Que sera, sera. The Doris Day hit from Hitchcock's film was a huge hit in Sweden and became one of Frida's favourite songs. At 13, she convinced a local band leader to let her sing with them. Frida's music career had started. By the time she was 16, Frida was singing with a local big band. She'd moved from the simple tune of Que Sera, Sera to the more complex jazz of Sweet Georgia Brown. At last, she felt as though she belonged. It turned her life around in a way, because she'd always enjoyed music and loved music, but now she found that music was actually her, it became her whole life, and the band became her family more than her grandmother. She soon fell in love with the band's trombonist. At just 17, she had her first child, a son, Hans. A daughter, Lisa Lotte, soon followed. But if she wanted to make it as a singer, she would have to move to Stockholm. Reluctantly, Frida decided to leave her husband and children and pursue her career. She was so emotionally unfulfilled at the time. She, I mean, she didn't really have a, a, a real childhood. She had to grow up much earlier than most children. And she was still searching for some kind of fulfillment. And the, I think her ambition was her, the, her version of emotional fulfillment at the time. That was the only thing she could find that could really give her uh, you know, good um, uh, emotional payoff, was to sing and to meet the audience and, and, and have a good career and advance her career. Frida's career got a boost when she caught the eye of veteran Swedish cabaret artist Charlie Norman in 1969. She was a talk of the town among musicians. The, all the musicians like her singing. The guys didn't dance a bit. Let's try that girl from Eskilstuna she was. We loved her because uh, Nice, friendly, uh, good ear, a lot of laughs. No, she was, uh, oh, she was wonderful. She is wonderful. <laughs> she was uh, talking about she was dead. Off stage, Frida spoke little about her past, but clearly it had an impact on her personality on and off the stage. She was shy and timid, uh, 
when it's a lot of people around and uh, she was not so fond that time to be on stage and to have a lot of people looking at her. She, I think she preferred studio, you know. But as I remember it, she was not talking so much about herself. Especially not if it's, uh, what do you call it, kind of trouble or something. You don't mention it. As her career progressed, nobody learned about her flight from Norway or the eugenics experiment that lay behind her birth. And only later did Frida learn just how lucky she had been when her grandmother whisked her away to Sweden. She had escaped the miserable fate meted out to the Lebensborn children left behind in Norway. For unlike the rest of Europe, Norway decided to take their revenge one step further. For the sins of their parents, the children were to suffer. It wasn't just that they were hated as a reminder of the Nazi occupation. It was also widely believed, with a logic worthy of the Nazis themselves, that their German blood was defective and would make them fascists by nature. The Norwegian government wanted to deport them to Germany, but the British administration in Berlin refused. So they set up a committee which asked for the opinion of Ernolf Erdegaard, the country's leading psychiatrist. Erdegaard actually it diagnosed the group of about 10,000 mothers and 10,000 children. He said that a large proportion of these people, they must be said to carry bad genes. Actually, they were more or less to be labeled mentally retarded. So with a German soldier as a father and an unmarried mother, these children were genetically very bad and they belonged in, uh, yes, in special institutions for the mentally retarded or feeble-minded. In a staggering act of retribution, hundreds of healthy small children were forcibly incarcerated in mental institutions. Had Frida stayed in Norway, she too could have shared the fate of the Norwegian Lebensborn, innocent children sentenced to a childhood of abuse by their own government simply because they had a German father. Very many of us um, have psychological problems. Uh, there have been um, suicides, um, alcoholism, um, destroyed lives, bad health, um, not getting the schooling, uh, not getting into the labor market. Um, there are a lot of destroyed lives. By the time she was famous, Frida Lingstad knew that not only was she the daughter of a Nazi officer, but also that she had been born to be one of Hitler's master race, the future of the Third Reich. Harry Edgington's biography of ABBA revealed this to the world. And no one, least of all Frida herself, was prepared for the extraordinary events that would then unfold. Harry Edgington's biography turned Frida's world upside down. The first chapter of his book revealed the secret of Frida's life, and it was a secret that could have shattered the band's constructed wall of privacy. I think ABBA were marketed very, very cleverly. I mean, I don't know who did it, um, but I thought the whole, we call it branding nowadays, I hate that word actually, but brand everything's branded nowadays, but they probably were a group that were branded as well, if not better than some of the others. So therefore, any adverse published like that, uh, like for anybody actually, it wouldn't have been particularly good for them. In fact, the media reaction was surprisingly muted. The story caused barely a ripple. The tabloid press was a whole different animal in those days. It was all very much about you know getting them bigger and bigger coverage and, and making them bigger and bigger stars. Um, it was all about uh, accentuating the positive. Um, so, the, you know, the shadows, the kind of the, 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 the problems, didn't really start to emerge until years later. 
But the story didn't sink completely without trace. In Germany, the pop magazine Bravo followed up with an article about Frieda's naming Alfred Haser as her father. A little girl who was a reader of this magazine um, read the story about this man and about Frieda, and um, she said, well, my uncle is Alfred Hase. He wouldn't be the one, would he? <laughs> the girl and her father contacted Alfred Hase and asked him if he'd ever met a girl called Sinny Lingstad. Alfred Hase was shocked. He asked his brother, how, how do you know her? Well, yes, I know her. I met her when I was in Norway. And the uh, brother said, congratulations, you are the father of a very, very famous singer, one of ABBA, Frida. Frida's father, Alfred Haser, had not died on the retreat to Germany in 1945. But like Frida, he too had kept his past a secret. The retired pastry chef had never told his wife and children of his wartime affair with Frieda's mother. The news came as a shock to Alfred, who claims he didn't know Sidney was pregnant when he left her in Norway. It was going to be even more of a shock for Frieda, who believed that her father had died before she was born. The next step for Alfred, obviously, was to get in touch with his daughter and he started phoning uh, their offices uh, in Stockholm um, and trying to get in touch with her and she wouldn't come to the phone. She thought it was you know, a crank caller because obviously as a pop star you attract all kinds of people. She got a phone call from Alfred Haas out of the blue to say, you know, good morning, this is, this is your father calling. And considering that she thought he was, he was uh, dead in a troop ship, um, must have thrown her a lot. That was the time, 1977, when ABBA was like absolutely super, super, duper stars everywhere in the world. And we phoned up the office uh, of ABBA and told them, and they were, of course, very careful with it and shocked, because, um, you know, anybody could come along and say, well, I'm Alfred Hase. Alfred actually knew things that he couldn't have known unless he had been in Balang and known Sine Lingstad and her family and all that. So, uh, I mean, obviously she was shocked as well, you know. Her whole world turned upside down. And she decided that she wanted to meet him. Frida asked Alfred to fly to Stockholm. She wanted to keep the meeting secret, but the chance of that was small. It was safer to release the story herself. She was really determined to keep the whole thing as private and low-key as possible because she didn't want the press hanging around outside her house and trying to, you know, take, take pictures through the windows and all that and having to answer questions from journalists. When you think of some of the headlines that come out nowadays and would have come out possibly then, like Frida the Nazi, somebody, that sort of publicity sticks. One of the first rules of public relations is if something is coming out which is damaging, if possible, and it can't be avoided, do it yourself. So they, they kept it very low-key and they only, the only thing they did was they brought a photographer out there uh, to take some pictures of the event, but that was the only media uh, representative they, they had there at the time. When the time was right, Frieda's statement and photos of the meeting were released to the press. The strategy worked. In the welter of news, the story attracted little attention. But even if the media didn't catch on to the story, the events themselves made their mark on Frieda. At first, discovering her father looked like a childhood dream come true. So the first time the father and daughter met was actually outside Benny's and Frida's house because she was standing outside waiting for them to arrive and, and they did and uh, you know he had brought flowers and they embraced and they were in tears and it was just a very very emotional moment for both of them. Next day Frida called me and she said Booby 
I tell you, it's really true. He is my father because he knows all the details. We made photos and you can even tell when you, when you see us from the side um, that we have the same profile. His nose is mine, my nose is his. It was very, very moving. But life is more complicated than dreams. She was 35 and now she meets her father. And in the beginning, of, of course, it is very emotional. But then everybody goes back to normal. Everybody goes back to their lives. Frida's meetings with her father gradually tailed off. And currently, they are not in regular contact. In 1981, Frida faced a new crisis when she and husband Benny divorced after 13 years together. And a year later, with both couples now divorced, ABBA broke up and the four band members went their separate ways. I wasn't surprised when ABBA had split up because they had had a fantastic innings. I mean, I don't know where they could have gone from that particular point, but you know, all good things must come to an end eventually and, and theirs came and it came at a time when perhaps we were all ready as you know, pop fans to move on and, and, and buy somebody else's music. When Frida was a member of ABBA, she was so preoccupied by this whole business of being this, in this major pop group and everything that she, she didn't really have time to, to explore herself that much. I think she started towards the end of the, of the ABBA period to, to explore other things outside this, this, uh, this big payoff that she got from being a celebrity and being on stage and uh, you know, being a star and all that. And when the ABBA period ended, um, she made, you know, a couple of solo albums, um, but eventually she, reali she realized that I don't really want to be a public figure anymore, and she stepped out of the, of the limelight and started doing some more soul-searching and trying to really find out who she was really. And they've tried their solo careers. Benny and Bjorn have gone on to do other things and written big musicals and done well, and. It's a shame about the girls, how they've just sort of disappeared or regressed into their lives. She was, you know, she was uh, somebody who got into music at a very early age. She moved to Sweden when she was very young. Um, and so I don't think anybody would have blamed her for um, any indiscretions that may have been committed in, you know, about her. If you think about it logically, which unfortunately, when you read headlines, you sometimes don't, you say, isn't that awful? I mean, obviously, it's nothing to, it's not her fault that, uh, that what happened to her happened. And it's a very sad story. Like all the offspring of Hitler's monstrous master race plan, Frida has spent her life in its shadow, suffering years of confusion and depression. She was well known, she was famous, she was strong, but it's only lately that she has come forward saying that she's a German child. That tells something about the oppression 
and the shame that was brought up upon us. Once the lights are out and uh, everybody's gone home, she's sort of alone with herself and all her old demons and uh, and and uh, her all the unanswered questions from her childhood are still there. Frida Lingstad now lives alone and is rarely seen in public. Oh, this is a very sad story. I never known this, but today I have known it and I've gone through it. So, uh, yeah, this is very sad. A lot of atrocities done in the past. But uh, there was an outcome that was magnificent and uh, we still pray for them and I know they're gonna have a good life despite all this. Thank you, thank you guys for tuning in and I also say thank you for taking your time and if today is your first time please press that subscription button and also the notification bell so that next time you will be able to get these great videos see you again in our next reaction <laughs>